You're watching Aurora 8, proud to be serving Aurora, Colorado, an all-America city. Greetings and welcome to Dateline Aurora. Eight years ago, Morgan Carroll started her first term representing Aurora in the Colorado House of Representatives. Little did she know that a simple request to allow her to focus on floor debates would spark a war with lobbyists. She was told that her bills wouldn't pass and that she would not get reelected. Well, she not only survived that, she was elected to the Colorado State Senate in 2008 and again in 2012 and is now the first senator from Aurora to become Senate Majority Leader. We'll talk to State Senator Morgan Carroll about the big issues facing the state and her new book, Take Back Your Government, A Citizen's Guide to Grassroots Change, up next on Dateline Aurora. Greetings and welcome to Dateline Aurora. I'm Adam Dempsey. Some hot button issues are commanding attention at the state and the legislature this year from gun control, civil unions, fracking regulations, mention any of these, and you're bound to hear passionate arguments like everywhere. What is ahead and how you can make your opinion heard at the Capitol? That's a good question. Our guest today will help, will help us answer exactly that. Welcome back to our program, Senator Morgan Carroll. Thank you, Adam. You? Good to see you. I'm good. Your last name is my middle name. That always works. That, that works. No doubt about it. Um, you know, the one question that I know everybody uh, puts on a lot of people's minds is not fracking and all that, but what is a Senate majority leader? We hear about the governor. We hear about the president of the Senate. We hear about the Speaker of the House. What's this other title? It's an interesting question because we, uh, historically, the Senate president used to be the lieutenant governor and it was the Senate majority who really, um, where the power concentrated in the Senate. So yeah. what's good for Aurora about this, the Senate majority leader, you get to decide everyone who serves on what committee, who mm -hmm. chairs those committees, which gives you a lot of control over the public policy direction, yeah. but you also have control over the calendar. So what gets brought up when? Uh, and if anybody wants to really get legislation through, every single bill goes through the Senate Majority Leader if it's going to go into law and get signed. So uh -huh. the ability is to negotiate, to help come up with packages, to help problem solve, but to help put your strongest team in the strongest policy areas and to uh, decide the priority of mm -hmm. what you bring up on the floor. Now when you say put your strongest team in the strongest areas there, does that mean the other representatives from Aurora or around Aurora, they get to play in that too? That's right, really. So for everybody who's on the Senate, we're looking at where their strengths are. But if you mm -hmm. look at Aurora right now is really well represented um, yeah. by the entire legislative delegation. We have a member of Aurora, uh, Senator Mary Hodge, who serves on the Joint Budget Committee. Uh, Representative Nancy Todd is on transportation, which is really critical to the projects that are happening in Aurora, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative John Buckner, Representative Nancy Todd are serving us on education. Representative Rhonda Fields is chairing local government. Uh, so our team uh, in Aurora here uh, between the House and the Senate basically covers almost every position and policy area in the state capitol. So whoever you are in Aurora and whatever issues you're more, most yeah, passionate yeah. about, the chances are really very good that one of us in the Aurora delegation are actually in a position to be able to help. To be able to help and to make, uh, to make Aurora stronger, to give the citizens here a better city because you all are there and in those right spots. And even in sharing that, I guess there's a lot of coordination between the House and the Senate too about what's going to come up, where it's going to go, so that you have all your right people in the right places to make sure you get exactly what you want. Yeah, it's, it's true. We know that, for example, Representative Janice May in the Adams County portion of Aurora, she has a background um, in human services. So when we see a big package of bills coming out trying to reform the child welfare reform services mm -hmm. based on those child fatalities, we've got someone in Aurora, in fact, also Senator Linda Newell, also from a portion of her district in Aurora, 
uh, happen to have the right subject matter expertise. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for people in our community, they've got really good point people there um, in either chamber that they can go to to work mm -hmm. on those reforms. Uh, two things real, real quick, speaking of reforms. Uh, civil unions is probably one of those things that's more of a statewide issue than Aurora, but it does affect some people here in Aurora too. You all worked on it last year. I guess you won't have to work on it next year. You know, I don't think be we'll done. be working on it next year. Um, this has obviously come up for multiple years in a row, and this year we're, we're going to be saying a whole theme around different civil rights issues, and uh, I think by all accounts people are expecting that this year it will be passed, mm -hmm. and there won't be a need to come back to do it next yeah, year. Yeah, 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 the governor's going to sign it, that's good. The other thing is that fracking t tends to go on and on and on and on. Is that one where, I, 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 I guess, where the little things like how far away from someone's house you can actually do this stuff is something that uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of Aurorans are going to be interested in for a long time. Yeah, they have been and will continue to be. So the most recent round of rulemaking uh, extended the setback to 500 feet, mm -hmm. and it does expand the amount of water quality testing that happens before or afterwards. Okay. But for people who live around Murphy Creek or Cross Creek, um, we will be having an unprecedented volume of drilling activity um, closer than there ever has been before to homes and schools. And so even with that rulemaking, whatever flurry of bills we see throughout the process, and there will be many on this mm -hmm. session, uh, yeah. it's probably not going to be the end of it. We'll probably continue <laughs> to say multiple years of trying to figure out the right balance on those issues. Yeah, we'll be talking about this for a long time. Aurora is becoming a big city. I would say just, you, we used to say Aurora's growing, right? But it is becoming a big city. So you're probably seeing a lot of things and we'll be seeing in the future a lot of other things that other big cities across America have to deal with that are now going to be impacting Aurora. Does the legislature ever look ahead to see what they may be dealing with in the future to see Absolutely. if they can do it now or wait until then? How is that? How does Absolutely. That I mean, I think for all accounts, Aurora has arrived uh, absolutely on the scene and so one of the things we're looking ahead to uh, even for the upcoming session is we've looked at the industries that have helped Aurora's economy grow faster than the state and, and faster than many parts of the country so we will be seeing efforts to do competitive based grants to what's called the advanced industries there's seven advanced industries that Aurora yeah. is disproportionately represented so when you're thinking down the future we know that the whole bioscience complex on Anschutz is mm -hmm. a huge economic growth driver, as is Buckley and all of the associated industries around Buckley. So whether that's uh, defense, whether that's aerospace, whether it's the biosciences. So we're acting now, realizing that this is a really strong future for Aurora. The state does have a role to play for how we can continue to stimulate the economy there. Mm -hmm. But we also know that while transportation is a hybrid between uh, local and state and federal, that how we handle um, the 225 interchange, yeah. uh, how we handle the light rail, rail project, uh, Rep uh, Senator Todd has worked on issues this session that will make it easier for us to accept federal dollars for transit, meaning yeah. public yeah. transportation. Yeah. We're now big enough that as a city we need to think past everyone being an individual car strictly on roads and thinking more in terms of mass transit like other big cities would be doing um, both to improve the quality of life for people who are, are living and traveling in the city, but also as an economic development aspect for all the businesses that rely on easy access, easy parking, yeah. uh, so that Aurora becomes a destination, an economic destination, as well as a place to live. In the state house, is Aurora starting to rival Denver? Oh, I, well, we think we have surpassed Denver. Okay, so. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. I didn't, didn't mean to frame it like that. <laughs> but there seemed to be, uh, was it back in the day, there seemed to be the wonderful little competition that was going on. And now Aurora's grown so much that it's sort of like move over. You know, we're here too. I think we often used to see ourselves struggling for an identity in the shadows of Denver, and sometimes international and national press will refer to Aurora as a suburb of Denver, which is, of course, the worst thing you could do. Yeah. I think at this point we have grown so much as a city in our own right that we are no longer really seen as living in the shadows of Denver in the suburbs. But mm -hmm. I think even at the Capitol, people recognize that Aurora is a, a, a very significant uh, city and force in its own right at this point. And because we have grown there, it's essential that the citizens of Aurora become more involved 
in government, and you came up with this handy little book. I think, and yeah, I'm just flashing it here, but I'm sure there's one that's going to pop up there on the screen, too. Uh, this is like three quarters of an inch thick. You must have spent a whole bunch of time between sessions getting this thing done. Take Back Your Government, A Citizen's Guide to Grassroots Change. Why'd you write this book? You know, I was frustrated when I first started back in the House. Uh, there was a lot about the process that despite having studied political science, despite having a law degree, uh -huh. that I never knew. Yeah. And I never learned. And, um, and I was in a pretty active and involved family. And what I learned about, hey, there's three branches of government and here's how government works and what I saw really didn't, didn't line up. And one observation that occurred to me is that the people who have the most money, who can afford to hire lobbyists at the Capitol, are present all the time. Right. But one of the only real effective checks and balances to special interests at the Capitol are to lobbyists or when citizens get involved. And it really um, eventually just weighed on me and frustrated me to the point where, look, there's no way citizens can fight back if we don't do a better job of sort of pulling back the curtain mm -hmm. and sharing the secrets about how it really works. And the good news is, is that anybody can make or change law in the state of Colorado. It's really not that hard, but it is important that you be empowered with information about how it really works and realize um, that the most, uh, the most common way that people really do give up their power is just simply by assuming they have none and not trying to participate at all. Yeah, w when you said anyone can make law here, that kind of thing, I think the story of how you got involved in politics and elective politics is an example of that. Was it the uh, former city councilman Frank Weddick, Aurora, uh, uh, Arapahoe County Commissioner Frank Weddick, who sort of picked your interest or sort of said, you ought to do this. How did that work? Well, I was really um, not long out of law school and just looking to make a difference and, and realizing that um, if you're really interested in advocacy that you need to do more, uh, that I needed to do more. And I showed up just simply as a citizen trying to get more involved and uh, really had never thought about elected or political office and was surprised, uh, one, that really anybody can and should think about uh, the idea of running for office. This isn't just something that other people do. If you're passionate, if you care about your community and you're willing to work hard, you really should think about it. Yeah. Um, and getting in there, um, the reason I couldn't turn my back on the opportunity was as an attorney that was focusing on civil and consumer rights and sort of a s social justice advocacy based practice, you really realize sometimes the law is the problem. Mm -hmm. And what we do or fail to do every year in the Colorado State Legislature affects five million people, whether they realize it directly or not. Right. And then when you realize, okay, maybe not everyone wants to run for office, that's okay. All you need is one legislator out of a hundred. Anyone can introduce the bill. All you need is one legislator out of a hundred. And we can walk you through the process. So if you ever look and you say, well, how come no one is running a bill on this? Or how come no one's doing that? You don't have to wait for a legislator to do it. You can take your own good idea to any one of the hundred of us. And all it takes is one of us saying, yes, I'll help you. We'll work with it. And what we found is that some of our best reforms, some of our most common sense reforms come from everyday citizens who are just passionate, who are willing to partner with us in problem solving. And we've had an astonishing array of real world laws and reforms passed that really do come from bottom up from mm -hmm. our constituents. And I think a lot of people would be surprised how accessible and possible it really is for any of us, anybody, um, to help make these reforms. Well, the reason why I, I used you as an example there, because one day you were doing whatever you like to do and you ran into Frank and he was talking about, oh, well, you too can be in the legislature. You know, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, yeah, me, sure. Uh-huh. Right. But it does happen and anyone out there can do it and anyone can be involved. And this book is one of those steps. You know, it is that easy to do. And uh, even though you, you indicated that you were a lawyer, you don't have to be a, a lawyer, as you said. That's right. You're just a passionate person who wants to be involved in making change. That's right. right? 
And, you know, so uh, a good thing for other folks to know, to your point about not needing to be a lawyer, um, we have drafters. So all a citizen has to do is have an idea or a concept, and we can convert that uh, through our nonpartisan staff. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty advanced. Um, the more typical way that citizens can get involved if they're not ready to start off with their own bill right out of the gate is it does make a difference to call, to email, mm -hmm. to send petitions. And the most important tip I hope people take away in Colorado is that we're one of the few states where citizens have a constitutional right to testify for or against mm -hmm. any bill and every bill must get a public hearing. So the idea of a backdoor deal of kind of quietly pocket vetoing a bill because you don't like it or you don't like the sponsor, no. Yeah. And that's not true in DC, that's not true in most states. So um, uh, many, many Colorado citizens would benefit from knowing that this is a right they have, it's very powerful, it's an important check and balance to lobbyists, and you don't need anyone's permission. Anyone can show up anytime to testify on a bill on the calendar and they're always welcome to do so. What's the most important chapter in the book? I think the chapter on advocacy for busy people. And the reason I... Advocacy for busy people? For busy people. To okay. In what you can do in 10 minutes or less. Oh, okay. And the reason yeah. I bring that up is when I've talked with so many other people about why they don't get involved, the mm -hmm. first barrier is, well, I don't know if it'll make any difference. And once they realize, well, actually it will, then you hear, well, look, they may be caring for parents or children. They're living, they're working, they're busy. And what's nice to know about that chapter is it's a whole list of things that you can do in 10 minutes or less per year. Mm -hmm. And if every, if every constituent, if every citizen just put 10 minutes a year on a letter, a phone call, on testimony, on coming up with fact sheets, on meeting your legislators perhaps at a town hall yeah, meeting, yeah, yeah. it would radically revolutionize just the entire project. Just 10 minutes a year. And that takes, what it does is it divests the power away from the wealthier special interests. Mm -hmm. And it means by definition that the majority of input we would then be getting would be from the people we actually represent, yeah. which can only help the process. Mm -hmm. uh, does it also help if, uh, if a person wants to become a little more involved by working in a political campaign, for example? Passing out stuff, walking, uh, walking a district, for example? maybe one Saturday out of the uh, legislative season. Yeah. That may help. You know, meeting your legislators, uh, there's always going to be a hunger for volunteer help, whether it's during an election season or after an election season. Legislators, we are very, very radically understaffed. So for a district with, say, 150,000 constituents, we only have part-time help. So you can, if you want to get involved uh, in the election season, if you want to get involved at the Capitol, all legislators are basically always taking volunteers all the time. And there's really almost no better way to see the process, mm -hmm. to demystify it, to get comfortable, and to really realize how it works. And so if anyone has time on their hands and they're interested in learning more, you will learn a lifetime of information just even with a little bit of volunteer time, for example, mm -hmm. at the Capitol or during an election cycle. I ask you what was the most important chapter in the book. What was the most challenging one to write? What was the one that sort of gave you sweaty palms? I said, shall I put this in here? Maybe it's too technical, maybe it's too inside baseball, but people need to know it anyway, and you have to take your time yeah. putting it together. I have two answers to that. In one sense, the chapter on how to read the budget yeah. Because how do you ever, the budget is one of the most complicated things legislators will ever face and it feels impenetrable and inaccessible to most people. And so mm -hmm. how do you, how can you write a chapter on teaching regular people that they actually can and should and, and can have an impact on our state's uh, budget decisions? That was a challenge in one sense. but. In some ways, the hardest chapters were really writing about the individual citizens because in here, besides a list of how-tos and examples, are stories of real people in Colorado who've made and changed law in their stories. And the reason why those were the hardest yeah. is because anytime you are a caretaker or uh, responsible for being the, the voice or the spokesperson for someone else's incredibly personal story, you, it's, you, it's a lot of pressure to try and make sure you yeah, do it sure, justice. Sure, yeah, and yeah, it's in a yeah. small number of pages. So when you're speaking for what moves someone or how mm. they got involved or their voice, and yet you still want other people to be, a see, be able to see a little bit of themselves in, in their stories as well, that it's not just people like them that get involved, 
but I wanted to feature stories of people who never thought that they would be involved and found themselves involved and actually made and changed laws in the real world and improved public policy because they did. And these are stories that anyone reading the book can probably identify with that, oh yeah, I could probably do that too. You know, real world stories brings it home and makes it real for, for the reader to say, yeah, I can, be I can be involved there. That's exactly the hope too, yeah. is to be like, you know, they did it and I think I could do it too. Is it one of those, those things where you sort of tired of hearing people say, oh, the government did it, there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And what you're screaming at them is, yes, you can. Our system is set up for that. That's right. Um, you know, underneath this whole thing is a fundamental question of is government an it or is it a we? <laughs> and when our founders set us up to be a representative democracy, like anything else, um, our democracy is more healthy and more vibrant when yeah. people are participating, when they're engaged. You give us better input, we get better output. The more apathy or disinterest or cynicism, it winds up actually making the system worse because then people don't even try. And all that's left, the way to guarantee inside baseball in mm -hmm. government or politics is for regular people to sit it out. And by doing that, when regular people go, oh, you know, I can't make a difference or I don't want to or why bother, the problem with that is whether people mean to or not, they're essentially handing over a proxy vote to some lobbyist where odds are they really don't represent your interests. Right. And so the, the direction we go couldn't be more radically different. With healthy, robust involvement, we actually see a functional system that really does represent the people. And when people don't get involved, we actually see a fairly dysfunctional system where um, maybe the wrong factors are deciding <laughs> public policy. What goes on, yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You also put in the book um, some of the laws and how to become involved in other states, for example. What was the idea of there? Because people come into Colorado and they leave and they go elsewhere so they could take their grassroots activism elsewhere. That's right. So in the back of the book are 50 state comparisons on rules, how the legislature, when it meets. And the thinking there is one, that the information in this book isn't just limited to Colorado. Yes, you can take it with you. But the book was also sold, sold around the country because we are also in a period, of, this is a national question at some, to some extent of what is our identity, can people get involved, mm -hmm. and how to get involved. And so I wanted to make sure that irrespective of what state someone lived in, that they would have the resources at their fingertips. This doesn't deal with Congress in D.C., which admittedly has its own different problems. But at the state level and at the local level where you can really meet your elected officials face to face, it was important that wherever you lived in the country, that people would have real world easy tools um, with an honest assessment with practical tips about how you can actually get involved and what not to do, yeah, as yeah. well as what to do. What other things may be facing the state outside this legislative season? We probably have a pretty good idea on what's going on. You know, it's, Civil unions, gun, gun control is there. What are long-term things that we have to uh, be thinking about, too? Long-term, we need to figure out school finance. Um, the state of Colorado is facing a billion-dollar shortfall from a Lobato suit that people may have realized that we're constitutionally short a billion dollars of our obligations to K-12 education. And that's not just a wish list. That's actually a legal violation. What we're finding is that our School Finance Act hasn't been updated in a really long time. And so there's two fronts, adequacy mm -hmm. of uh, funding for our schools and um, really equity, which is out of that pie, is the pie big enough and are we dividing it in a way that's most equitable? And right now our formula doesn't necessarily um, best acknowledge or weigh the factors that are the challenges that each of the districts are facing. Yeah, but didn't we pass a state amendment that K-12 had to be funded at a certain level all the time and that became, um, what, in conflict with Tabor or something like that a couple of years ago and, and those are still on the books and that's not taking care of that. Then. That's right, because what it's part of is the bigger, um, what some of us call a fiscal knot. Yeah. Um, a physical knot. A fiscal knot. Okay, we got the physical <laughs> cliff and now we have the physical knot. Now this is the, Colorado has a fiscal knot rather okay. than a fiscal cliff. And what, yeah. what our fiscal knot is, is 
Most people don't budget in the Constitution, and Constitution's meant to be a permanent and unchanging document, and yet, because Colorado um, ha makes it as easy to change the Constitution as statutes, many times people are, aren't always aware of whether they're amending a Constitution or statute. So what we mm -hmm. have are constitutional measures that mandate your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time, and when they're written, have no other um, context for the other math and budgeting requirements that are also now in the Constitution. And so what happens is it's authified, mm -hmm. it's unchangeable unless we take a massive package back to the voters to sort of untangle this knot. And you can find critics uh, from the left, right, and middle, and everyone in between about yeah. the problems with trying to budget by way of Constitution. So long term, and this ultimately is going to require some kind of partnership with the people mm -hmm. uh, where we have to do a good enough job of explaining that this isn't just a wish list of, hey, people would like more money, but that the fiscally responsible thing to do in order to put accountability back in the system is to make sure that you can take each budget decision based on what is actually needed, where you get the best financial return on your dollar, and now that we're starting to get a little smarter about evidence-based practices, whether it's on corrections or education, yeah. you need to be able, you know, your budget is a surgical document. You need to be able to get in there in a very smart way and surgically adapt your budget. And what we've got is a very crude Franken creature in our constitution <laughs> that, that we can't fix without dealing with multiple subjects. Uh, consider whether it should come out of the Constitution, and none of this is possible to fix without ultimately taking it to the ballot and asking the public, how would you prefer that we fix this? Yeah, that's yeah, probably where it's going to have to go. Speaking of fixing things, we got about a minute or so left. Um, the citizens passed the bill, uh, passed the bill, passed an uh, amendment for marijuana. Is that going to be every session, the next few sessions, massaging it? Can people drive while they're is high the right word to use? I don't know what the right word to use now is. You know, whether what uh, other influences, all those things have to be straightened out. Is this going to be an ongoing thing? And it's probably going to, I, I feel like it's going to be like uh, alcohol. You know, it's going to probably take a lot of the lessons from, from that to see what's going to be useful, what's going to be in law, and what's not. That's exactly the model that's being looked at. So the, yeah. the task force uh, that has been set up is to look at the model of how we've regulated alcohol and see what's worked and what hasn't and to mm -hmm. try and carry over as much as we can. The reality is it's been illegal and it's illegal now to drive under the influence of anything, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, yeah. opiates, or prescription drugs. But the, there's going to be an ongoing education effort as this comes through where people are now wondering, okay, well, how does that change, for example, drug testing policies wow. at work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of things voters um, are going to be hearing past this immediate year is many people thought that there was revenue that came with it because they said, hey, you can regulate it and <laughs> tax it like alcohol. But there is no revenue without going back, back to the to ballot the again for a second issue saying, dear voters, do you in fact want to raise X amount of revenue for this purpose, and if that doesn't pass, then there's no revenue being generated yep. from its passage. And if it does pass, to your point, we will be talking about it for, I'm sure, quite a while. Oh, to come. those are going to be two <laughs> really fun things: fracking and marijuana all together. Yes. You got quite of a job there. Thank you very much for sharing the time. And the name of the book again is "Take Back Your Government: A Citizen's Guide to Grassroots Change." And we can all become involved. Ten minutes a year. That's all it's going to take. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for joining us on Dateline Aurora. That's all the time we have for this edition, and we thank you for watching as well. And we hope to see you back here again next month. I'm Adam Dempsey. Good evening.